Ready? Here we go. Okay. Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 294, the Teaching and Research Nexus. Now, why have I used such a cliched phrase for this vlog? I hate this phrase, but actually if we pick the scab of that phrase, we see there's some powerful content there exploring the relationship with all the parts of who we are as academics. The teaching, the research, the community service, the community engagement, and so many of our systems and structures in universities encourage us to cut bits and pieces of teaching and research away and focus, you know, get a focus, get a priority and work those KPIs. But that's not why many of us got into this business. We got into this business before it was a business, and we got into this business to explore the relationships between teaching and research. So I want to get inside this cliche, and I want to embody this cliche with a remarkable, remarkable man. Professor Will Peterson is a friend of mine. Uh, he's a brother from another mother. This man I would walk through fire for. He is a legendary, extraordinary academic and a legendary and an extraordinary human. Now, Will joined us at Flinders in 2014 and he joined us from Monash, where he was the director of the Centre for Theatre and Performance. But previously he'd worked in Singapore, obviously in the United States and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now, Will holds a PhD from the University of Texas, Austin, a master's from San Diego State, and importantly, and this will be important in a sec, a graduate certificate in higher education from Monash. That's going to be really important too. Now, he's won more book prizes than any human I've ever known. He is, I think, without a doubt, the best high degree supervisor at Flinders University, and he is simply, and it's a phrase I rarely use, a magisterial writer, a magisterial writer. And he's one of the truly great innovators in a field that is frequently called critical drama studies. It is my pleasure colleagues to welcome you. And so you can see and learn from Will Peterson. Hi, Will. Oh, hey, Tara. I am so delighted to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. You, you are just amazing and look, We've got a lot to talk about today, about research and about teaching, but maybe I suppose we're going to be having a lot of meta conversations about the nature of higher education too. You and I have been around and about, and so probably how we think and feel about higher education and its state in the world at the moment could be part of our conversation. But I did want to start with, you've worked in four nations, Will, and you've got partnerships with by my count through your publications, 20 plus different nations. So what is the, what is the gift of, of mobility for scholars, mate? Yeah, it's a, yeah, well, a gift. Let's start with necessity, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it's like it became a gift, but it started from necessity. And I think that's the world that many of us are in now. But even when I got into it, it's like I did my PhD a million years ago. Um, back in the days of the dinosaurs, as, as Tara would say, or Pleistocene era, right? And um, and when I and when I was going through it, they told us lies. Imagine that. Even back in those days, they told us lies. They told us that the G this was in the U.S. So they said the GI Bill professors, the old farts, mostly male, you know, the guys that got their education with the GI Bill after World War II. So that was a generational thing when the universities expanded hugely in the U.S. in the 50s and 60s. And there were all of these people who got PhDs and ran all these programs. And they said, OK, by the late 80s, early 90s, they said, all these guys are going to re re retire and there's going to be lots and lots and lots of jobs. <laughs> so we did our PhD. I, I mean, I never believed that because I'm just that kind of person. I kind of thought, Oh, I'm not so sure. I don't know how this is going to pan out. But at any rate, it didn't. They lied to us. And in fact, almost <laughs> everybody, I went to the top ranked program in my field. So I was trained as a theater historian. So I go to the best program in the field. And, um, and, and it was so good that we were, we were studying under the famous dude, the famous theater historian, Oscar Brockett, a wonderful human being. Um, uh, now long gone, and um, we were we were called collectively Brockett's Rockets. 
You know, that's how, woo, imagine that, your rocket's rocket. You know, so it was just kind of like, well, you'll be getting a job because you're trained as a practitioner, you got some practice, you got the PhD and you're a rocket rocket. You're in like, you know, Flynn. And, um, you know, there, there was of my graduating cohort, I think there were about six or seven of us completed at around the same time. One got a job immediately at the University of Hawaii. Oof. And um, and um, I we were all so jealous of her. We were like, oh my God, you get the brass ring. She was the youngest one of our bunch. We were so envious. But I think now if I had gotten that job or a similar job, I probably would have hit the road anyway. So part of it was, you know, I'm, I'm no longer, you know, I got rid of the envy long ago. So I got my first job, my first real continuing position at the National University of Singapore. Yes. It was 1991. And it was a time when no one was applying for jobs. Uh, for, no one from, very few people from the West were applying for jobs in Asian countries. Yes. Got that job because there wasn't much competition, frankly. I mean, there were now today, there'd probably be a hundred people who would apply for that job. Maybe there were 20 or something, but at any rate, I rose to the top of the heap. They hired two people, me, that they, they called me the theory guy when I got there. And I'm like a theoretical nincompoop. So right from the start, it was just like, you're coming in and you hired me and you think I'm like the theory guy. I'm like, ah, I try to make sense of stuff, but I'm not <laughs> the theory guy. Um, but it was, but it really came from job insecurity that drove me overseas. Now, yes. um, the gift is that your research and your teaching will evolve in a very different way than if you stay in one place, right? Mm. There is the possibility of a more organic growth curve if you are moving every five to six years because you have to, it's just, it's just simply you learn new stuff, you're exposed to new things and your research will and your interests will, will evolve. Um, the other thing that we'll give you, it, I call it my, you know, I think of it as my homies. Where are my homies in terms of research in teaching. My yeah. homies are all over the world. They're not in one place. I've got more homies in Singapore, in the Netherlands, right? In the Philippines, yeah. in parts of the US than I will ever have in Australia because yeah. those are the people whose research engages with mine and mine evolved in concert with them. If you stay in one place, your research will, particularly if you're in a system like the Australian system, which encourages you to work in teams, you will be working with like-minded people around particular topics of mutual shared interest, but it's like, it isn't gonna have that possibility for explosive organic growth, right? So, um, you're not that's dependent crazy. on the man. I mean, so that's the other thing. It's like in the neoliberal university system from hell that many of us have found ourselves in, you yeah. have greater control over your destiny. If you Boom. think if things are going to blow up, I can leave. And the reason you can leave is because opportunities will be presented to you because of that kind of life that you would never have if you stayed put right? Because you will know more people. You are more open to others. You will have people knocking on your door when you least expect it, right? So you will be known and valued and respected in places where it really matters. Oh, which is, which is citizenship with diverse audiences and like-minded colleagues around the world. I mean, well, what you just talked about there is, of course, Karl Marx's double freedom. And you and I were probably always going to go to Karl Marx during your vlog. And, you know, I think it is important to recognise that. Karl Marx argued, you know, the first freedom is we only have the freedom to sell our labour power. Yeah. But the second freedom is we can sell it to anyone. And so what you've demonstrated is the power of the double freedom. And we mustn't forget the second freedom and ensure our students don't either. That's right. That's right. Oh, amazing. Now, the other interesting, profound bit of your career, besides the remarkable mobility conversation, which, again, I think will change students' lives, the other interesting component of your career are these visiting professorships. Now, I've never had one of those and I'm fascinated by them. So what are they and how do they operate in enabling teaching and or research? Well, what's the role in a career of a visiting professorship? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I should probably distinguish, I called, some things are called, I've called visiting professorships because the institution called them that. Yes. Um, and what that meant is I was there in an unpaid or partially paid position. I had resources, I had library, I had homies. Um, and I had an opportunity to be on the ground to do research. And maybe in exchange for that, I might be running some seminars. 
Um, so um, I've also had a number of fellowships, including research fellowships, a number of them actually at the um, um, uh, at the in, um, um, in, in, at the University of Leiden at their Asia Studies Institute. Yes, and they've been particularly fruitful because. Um, well, you can focus in a more extended way on, on something that uh, without interruptions. But the, the, the other thing, I think the, the, the key thing, like with respect to the fellowships, the ones that I've had at NUS in, in Singapore at the Asia Research Institute and at the International Institute for Asian Studies at, at uh, Leiden, is that you are in a hothouse environment with other people who do the kind of work that you do. Those fellowships are organized, um, the research areas are typically organized around themes. So it's like you shop around, you look at research, you know, research institutes where you think there might be some alignment. You go through the themes, you see, oh, wow, well, there's, there, that's a theme where I'm interested. And then you see who's working in it and you're like, yeah, yeah, these people are my homies. And then you look at who's running it and you're like, oh uh, yeah, yeah, that one, that guy, that, that she's amazing, right? So <laughs> sign me up and you put the application in and you go. And then when you're there, you're there, you're there, there's kind of two tiers. So if you're there as a recent PhD, um, the ones in Europe and the ones in Singapore are designed for recent PhDs and they give you money. So like apply for these things for God's yes. sakes. It's like you, they give you enough money to live in places like the Netherlands or Singapore. Now, the expectation is you will complete you're, you will turn your book, your PhD, into a book and get nice. a publication contract or have it, you know, in train while you're there, right? So nice. that's, it's, it's a kind of gap year in which you can establish yourself as a scholar. And these, these are available to anybody anywhere in the world. So, but if you're there as a mid-career, as a senior academic, imagine what this is like. The shot in the arm that that gives you. It's like, it's like adrenaline, right? So it's like the best and the brightest postgrads, PhD students you've ever hung with in your life. They're from all over the world. They're in your field. They're hot from doing research in Mongolia. They've been sleeping in yurts for years, writing about Mongolian husbandry and speak for the local dialects and are on their way to a job at the Sorbonne. Wow. I'm not making this up. That's just one of my myths. Wow. Okay. So that's, those are the kind of people that you're hanging out with. And it's you and maybe a few other I have to say it's a self-selected group. So the, the older folks are kind of pretty cool, I have to say, you know, so they're hanging with the younger ones and we're having a blast. It's just like going back to school, only it's better, right? It's really, truly in technicolor. So you can't, you can't beat that. But I would draw a distinction between, say, something that is initiated between you and an individual at a partnering institution where you've got some shared interests. And then out of that, they might create the space for you to come as a visiting professor. They might be able to give you some money and some teaching. And then these, these research fellowships that are available and, the, and what they give you, particularly the ones in Europe or Singapore, it's based on need. If you're in a, if you've got a job and you're salaried and you've got a sabbatical or period of study leave, they're not going to pay you. They might pay for you to get there, okay? Yeah. Um, but they're not gonna pay you because you don't need the money. The money needs to go to the emerging scholars um, who need it to just survive. But what happened in these places, two monographs that could never have been written. My two best monographs were wow. written there because I there were just too many interruptions, right? It's hard to write a, a really complicated, bless you for using that word magisterial, but. If, if that quality pervades my writings, it is because I've had the time to think and stop and block out everything else, and also to be in a stimulating environment where there were other bright sparks, many of them 20, 30, 40 years younger than, than, than I am. The other thing, there are two other points I wanted to make here about Please. that. It will, it will serve, again, as with the international life, it will open up research pathways that you never imagined. So that, that almost goes without saying. Mental health. There's great mental health reasons for doing this, for stepping off the crazy train, stepping out, taking a step to the side, taking that six months or a year if you can do it off. And because that will give you great clarity. Here's an example. So I go from my happy place in the Netherlands, and it is a happy place. I've got some European roots. I've got a lot of friends in Europe. I've spent a lot of time there. I am quite at home in Leiden, in, in the Netherlands, and in Amsterdam. And, and I come back, and I was in a pretty blessed place. I have to say, University of Leiden is one of the oldest universities in Europe. It is. It's pretty great. 
and it still main, it still functions as as a proper university. It hasn't been taken over by the neoliberal forces from hell. Right? Yes. I don't know how much longer they can hold out. That may change in the next ten minutes. But anyway, so yes. I come back. It's twenty. It's 20, 30, 2014, and and things are not very bad at the university. Not very good at all at the university. I come back to it's 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 not my current employer, but it was my previous employer. Yes, and I get into the staff room, and all hell is breaking loose. There's all the usual, you know, blah, we're all under fire, we're under threat, batting down the hatches. And one of my colleagues says in a staff meeting, and it's like this everywhere. And I said, no, no, thank you. I said no. I, you know, I have, you know I, have, I have climbed the mountain and I've come down. You know, it's like, it is not that way everywhere. It doesn't have to be this way everywhere. I just come back from a place where it's like this. And they looked at me like, is that possible? Now, if I had never gotten out, I would never know that. I would say yeah. every place is like this. Of course it is. That's the way it's, that's, that's our experience. We assume every place is equally screwed up in the same ways. And it really isn't. And then the final thing is that, that I mean, you know, what you get out of that, that kind of sustained period in another country and another culture is that you will become equally at home in many places in this world. And that is the gift that keeps giving, right? Because you carry with that, with that with you every day of your life. You can be in multiple places, and those places live within you. Oh, brother! <laughs> right? You're carrying them with you, and um, yeah, and well, hey, that's. I, I was going to say that is the most. I'm just. I'm tearing up. That's just the most amazing thing. So the places mm -hmm. transform you. They shape you, but they remain with you. And I think that's the most beautiful yeah. poetic expression anyone's ever given me. That you live through these places, and then they live in you and you carry them forward to the next job. So you, with some honesty, have seen how the world works and you don't believe the hype or the generalizations anymore. That's right, yeah. You're amazing. Now, the, the next question I, I've never asked you in all the time we've known each other, Will, and I want to ask about teaching, because I think we focus a lot on mobility and research, meeting the interesting people, writing the books, mm -hmm. getting the grants, doing that sort of stuff. But we don't, and I, I read very rarely on this, about the impact of the mobility of academics on the calibre and the quality of teaching. Have you got a view on that? Yeah, 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 I absolutely do. I mean, I, well, I, could, the, the, I would start by saying my teaching is a whole lot better than it would have been if I had stayed in one place. I, I'm really absolutely certain of that. I mean, when I started out, I think like many academics, I, I was around I was around 30. A lot of people start young, younger than that, I, as I believe you did in the classroom. But I mean, I had that I had that youthful. I was 30. I looked like I was 19. You know, I was this skinny blonde guy with cool hair. You know, and you were you know, you it was just like I had I had youthful enthusiasm, right? And I you know, and I had I could speak well, and I could be energetic, and I had sort of personal qualities. But really, when people responded to my teaching, I think they were really responding to me, okay? So, I mean, I think a lot of it what is that way for younger teachers. But if you, if, you, if you are going to new places, first of all, your content is going to shift. What you teach shifts, right? It's like you will be, you will, it will of necessity have to shift. For instance, I go to Singapore and they had a sort of performance studies curriculum that it looked like they cribbed from NYU. I couldn't even make any sense of it. You know, it was just like, because of course the people who had put it together were people who were looking to those overseas models. And I get there and I'm like, I wasn't trained as an Asianist. I was trained really as like this Western theater historian. I wrote about performance art on the West Coast. You yeah. know, I had this, I had this strong interest in feminist performance art and queer performance art. That's, that's the kind of stuff that I was writing about. So I had no background in Asian anything, frankly, other than just having lived on the West Coast. But I look at the curriculum and I'm like, uh, hold on, we're in Singapore. I thought we were, I thought this was Southeast Asia. <laughs> like, like, why is there no Asian performance content? Why are we not looking at traditional Asian forms, some of which are being performed in your backyard, uh, down the street, your grandmas and aunties are going to see Hokkien opera, Teochew opera, Cantonese opera. So I, so I just, you know, I put my hand up for that. Um, my transformation into being an Asianist started from the teaching because just really? yeah, because I needed that. It was the content. I thought the content needed to be there, and so did my colleagues. 
post-colonial theater, okay? So that was certainly what was circulating, you know, a million years ago when I was starting. And if you were outside the U.S., if you were in the U.S., you didn't, you had never even heard the word post-colonial. So it's like, so I'm teaching post-colonial theater from former colonized countries, right? I've got a class in it. I go back to the U.S., and I offer this class and one of my colleagues, the senior colleague who re was retiring at the time is looking at that and she was like making jokes about it. She was like, post-colonial, is that like theater of the American revolution? <laughs> you know, it's like, there was just no concept. So it's like, I come back and it was like, right. it was just like, uh, they, we're not even living in the same no. world, right? No. So your delivery modes will change, content changes. Delivery modes will absolutely change. They change because they have to because what worked in one place will not work in another. Will not work in another. Yep. Like I discovered, for instance, I mean, I, 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 I come from a sort of churchy background, so I could use shame a little bit in Singapore. That worked okay. I understood how awesome. to manipulate that. You know, it worked yeah, fine yeah. with Asian students in, in Singapore, and I can manipulate it. And, and it worked a little bit in New Zealand, you know? <laughs> if, it's like if I could do, I could, I'm so disappointed in you. It yes. meant something, and they felt bad, and they came back way better the next time in Australia. No. Yeah, nothing. No, like no, no shame. Shameless country. No, doesn't work. Had to develop no. new, new strategies, <laughs> new, new, new delivery modes. You become cross-cultural in your teaching and in your life as well, right? Yes. So this is the other thing. It's like when you are there on the ground and you figure out what works, what doesn't work. Um, and particularly working in the performing arts, I also had the, the opportunity to direct students in productions in many different mm -hmm. countries, Singapore and New Zealand. And it's like you, you come to understand through that durational experience that somebody who grew up in an environment where they speak English at home, they learned Mandarin in school, their grandma speaks Hokkien, the other side of the family speaks Teo Chu, we're talking some years ago. It's like, so their idea of acting, of what it means to act, of being an expressive person, it's so complicated by culture and language and communication styles. Now, you can't, you can't show up in Singapore. You can't get that from a weekend seminar. But you get that over years of months and years in the country with students. So I think that also makes you, uh, it, it makes you... Uh, uh, I don't know if it's a better person, but it gives you more empathy and understanding for other subjectivities. Look, look, it does, Will. And I've, when people have often said, and they've said it to you and I, we've been in the same meetings where they've gone, oh, look, I've gone to conferences in these places. And like, from my line is, unless you've had to work out how to pay an electricity bill in a nation, so you've had to stay there long enough to, how does a healthcare system operate? Um, how do you get your groceries? There's that, so, you know, so it's like you're there long enough to actually have to manage, have stuff go wrong, have no idea what's going on and somehow have to make it work. I think that does something powerful for you as a teacher, as a researcher, as a scholar and as a human, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> While you were just saying that, I was thinking when I got to Singapore, it was there was no IKEA in Singapore in, 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 in the early 90s. I literally could not figure out how to buy like a mop and a broom yeah. and cleaning supplies. I had no idea <laughs> because they didn't sell them in stores like they would have in the US. Just even at that level, everything had to be <laughs> learned. But it's funny, so, okay, I have to mop the floor. Where the hell am I going to buy a mop, right? So that's what I'm sort of saying. So, so those sort of rudimentary transformational structures, you know, just change you, change you as a human and make you more robust, I think, add a bit of grit and also have a respectfulness for colleagues who do things differently. Yeah. And of course, then I'm getting to the crunchy one, which again, I've never asked you this question directly, although I'm quite obsessed by your research in this area. So what then drew you to this powerful research on dance, on religion, on theater in the Philippines? So, so how did we get there, Will? What's the story around that cluster of expertise? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think maybe I'll end with the, 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 the deeply personal, but I'm going to start with where it happened. Okay. What? It happened in the room where it happened. Okay. So the room where it happened, it was Singapore. It was 1992, 93. And Singapore was a pretty uptight place to work then. My boss had indirectly told my partner that 
my phones were tapped and we suspected they were. At any rate, you yes. felt like you were under some surveillance. You were in the hot seat. It was the first time theater had been taught in Singapore at the at the university level. And there was very there was a lot. Anyway, so that was the that was the context. So <laughs> I go into a room at the National University and um, they've got two visiting overseas scholars, Nikanor Chung, Chung Sun, who um, at the time was head of the Cultural Center of the Philippines under the Cory Aquino government. So mm. we've come out of the shadow of the Marcos. We've had people power revolution mm. in the Philippines. It was a country that I knew a bit about as, a, as someone who had lived in California. And um, yeah, so, um, so this guy shows up and he shows up with Doreen Fernandez, who is the senior professor of theater and, um, and a sociologist. And I walk in the room and I'm like, I like you people. I really like you people. I feel connected to you two. I felt connected to those two in a weird way. They were like family members. And I think part of it was feeling so needy in some ways for some kind of emotional connection with, with, with others that I shared some feelings and cultural reference with. And there, so there was this sense of familiarity. And I thought, and that stuck with me for years and years and years. So I had invitations to go to the Philippines to do research. Um, but, um, but it really took, it took many years before it, before, it, before it finally happened. So you fast forward to 2001, um, I go to the Philippines and I'm thinking, well, what should I work on? So I, I know many Filipino, Phil Ams, as we call them in Southern California, networked with Phil Ams. I'm ready to go. I've done my research. I know about the People's Educational Theater Association, PETA, not the other PETA, which, yes. is, you know, which is the group that for 20 or more years up to that point had been working on socially just, social justice, socially conscious political theater, you know, working with poor communities. I'm thinking that's, that's where it's all going to happen. That's it. So I go there, I, I got my, I got my plan and I get there and I realize, oh, the glory days of this group really were some years ago. And it's really kind of, you know, it's moving into another territory generationally. And it had also been written about, and I didn't even know that. I was so naive. I'm like, I realized that there was this Dutch guy, Eugene Van Urban, who had written this book on community-based theater, which I think, I don't think I had even read at the time I went there. And I got there, I'm like, I can't add anything to this. All I can do is describe it describe some of their programs. And I came back and I did that and I thought, oh, this is a kind of dead end. So then I go back in 2005. I still feel that there's something for me in the Philippines. I don't know what it is. Mm. And, um, so I get an attachment at, this is the beginning of the, the visiting professorship thing. And so I, I'm at the University of the Philippines and I'm hanging out in the staff room with the, the, the scene, you know, with the colleagues and the, you know, it's the room where we kind of hang out and have our coffees in the middle of the day. And I'm, I'm like, where should I go? What should I do? We're heading into Easter. And, and, um, and people are, of course, have lots of well-meaning advice. And I'm, they're saying, you should go to the socially conscious, politically, da, 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 da. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I had gone through the Lonely Planet and I had seen that there was this really wacky festival called the Moriones Festival. <laughs> and these guys wear these like crazy helmet heads, you know, looking like Moriones, looking yeah. very like fierce. They got these oh, fierce faces. And, but like, legions of them do it like this is a really it's a huge event and people have been you know boatloads of tourists used to go there from the 70s during the marcos era so i see this in lonely planet and i'm thinking this is so weird i've got to figure out what it is because it's big it's big enough to be in lonely planet as a recommended thing so i'm talking to my colleague about it and he says he's a senior academic he says don't go. It's bad theater. And then he tells me why it's bad theater. <laughs> it's like, it's voiceover. It's lip, lip synced. It's the, the voices of dead radio actors. And it's just amateurs. And it's like, but I'm thinking, but yeah, it goes on for an entire week. And there's discussions <laughs> in the streets and Roman centurions. And it's bad theater. And I'm like, well, I think, and that was it. That was the moment where the penny dropped when he said, don't go there. It's bad theater. Yeah because he was personally embarrassed. You know, I think also he was, as a serious theater person, this guy's a well-known director, uh, um, sadly passed away a few years ago. And it's like, I think I totally understand why he was telling me not to go, but I was driven there because he told me not to go. I knew there was something for me there. So, <laughs> so, so, so then life intervenes, my father dies, he's a heart attack. 
And this is like a week before I'm supposed to go or two weeks before I'm supposed to go. I'm like, I am going to this island, come hell or high water, to see the Moriones Festival in the town of Bullock. Right. And I'm very close to my father. And um, so I um, miraculously... I don't, it was some miracle. I book a flight and I get on a plane and I cry for 24 hours on a plane and yes. uh, go and bury my father in a snowstorm. And my father was a veteran. So it was quite dramatic. I mean, it was like, we're talking, you know, white crosses, snow, military, flag on the coffin, 21 oh, gun yeah. salute, boom, boom, boom. It's just like, oh. you know, I'm driving the car behind the white, you know, hers with the, yeah. uh, my mom sitting in the passenger seat. It oh, was really, it was intense. So I get back to the house and it's about, we're about four days and the house is full of people. I mean, I, why do I end up in the Philippines? Because also, because I come from people that are like that. So the house is full of people after my father dies. The neighbors bring over hot dishes. That's what we call them where I'm from. They bring over a hot dish because when you're in mourning and in grief, you may not eat well, you know, and people just bring stuff over and they show up and they hold your hand. Yeah. And so my mother's house was full of people. And by day four or five, she says, just, just, just go. Just go. Just, just, I think dad would want this. They, he died on vacation you know, in another state. It's like they, these, my parents hit the road. I mean, that's what they did in retirement. So like, you know, doesn't fall far from the tree. So yeah, so I go back to the Philippines and I've got a dear friend who comes with me whose grandpa is from that island. And we go through the whole thing and I'm taking pictures, doing my ethnography thing and trying to make sense of this complicated event. And so, um, to, so where, where it really, became embodied and where I felt like I would be compelled to return. Okay. And this is where the, I've written, I've used this phrase in, in, in my, you know, in my Philippines, in my book on happiness in the Philippines, yes. my body compels me to return to Atiatihan, right? Yes. Um, but it's like, it is, it is that kind of thing. So the body compelled me to return thing. It started when I'm walking, it's, it's Easter Sunday, you're sleep deprived, you're still processing the grief from your father's death. And it's 4 a.m. and the bells start clanging. It's, uh, I wasn't raised Catholic, but I do come from a churchy background. Okay, yeah. so the bells are clanging and all of this. And, and, and so we wake up and there's this whole procession. It ends with this procession. The procession is going up the hill to the church. And, it's, and we're, we've all got, the, they've got kados or floats with the saints on them. The effigies of the saints that have been taken out and they're going to go back to the church. And they're playing crazy music. I mean, there's a bad brass band. I played the trombone as a kid. They're playing, I will follow him. I will follow him. I mean, it's a 50s song. And then it was used as Twister Act by Whoopi Goldberg. I will follow him wherever he, so they're like crazy, crazy music. It's like 6 a.m. brass band. And, yeah, and so we're marching through the streets of this, of this provincial town. And we turned a corner and it was the last corners. We're heading up to the church. And my father's hand touched my shoulder. Oh. It was just like, he was just there. And my Easter had special significance for my father, um, more than it had for me. But it was just like, right, you're here with me. Yeah. And, and really, from that time on, I, I also went back to that place because I, my body compelled me to return because of the power of of that communion. And it's happened again, of course, not with that same electricity as the year mm. my father died, you know, just a week or two after he died. No, but, um, but it was, uh, it, it really, I wouldn't, again, you know, if I stayed home, if I had done my research locally, this would have never happened. Um, but so the reflective answer to that question about oh. interest is, because I was also asked when I wrote, when I wrote, when I wrote that book, um, Wonderful. You know, reviewer A, you know, reviewer A or, you know, reviewer two, we'll say, reviewer <laughs> two, the grumpy reviewers said like, hello, you know, why is this white guy who isn't even Catholic writing this book? Now, the reviewer phrased it in a more elegant way than that, but they were basically saying subject position, please, you know, yeah. and, and once I got over my, my sort of shock of how dare they, la, 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 la. I've been hanging out in the Philippines for years, you know, so I got on my emotional high horse, but of course yeah. I have every right to write this book. You know, Magsali's like, you know, Tagalog, county, county, you know, I, I mean, so, but then I reflected on it and I thought, ah, yeah, she wants to know why. Well, okay, why? Why? Because I was a child preacher. Yeah. 
that's that's also part of it. Why was I compelled? Why did that make sense to me? Why did that world make sense to me? Now, I didn't, I mean, my grandma, my mother's mother, who was very churchy, she was a free church Swede. I like different it. from Lutheran, so that's a particular kind of cultural religious construct. It and certainly she, is. Yeah, so we could have a whole lecture on that, but we won't. But she said before she passed away, when I was there with my same sex partner, she just, she, you know, don't ask, don't tell, that's the way it was. So we visit grandma in the, in the care facility, and she says to my partner, she was reflecting on the child preacher days. I only did, it was a summertime gig, basically, up at our cabin, and it was for neighbors. But it was like a lot of people showed up, you know, because it's unusual for a 12-year-old boy to like, you know, I did everything. You know, I gave the sermon. It was a serious wow. church service, you know. I wow. So, but she said to him, she said, we thought he was going to be the next Billy Graham. And the voice trailed off. And I thought, it's a good thing you never told me that. I mean, God bless my parents and my grandparents that they never put any expectation on that because I just like to perform. And I just thought, well, we're up here every summer, all, you know, on Sundays, there's no church nearby. We go to church the rest of the year. Let's go to church. I'll do it. If, you know, like, we'll just have our own church. It just made sense to me, right? So there was that. But then the other thing, and it's taken me years to figure this out, when, when, when you're in the Philippines, people do trust their instincts about people. And there's also cross-generational everything, particularly there is. among the communities I was hanging out with. So I'm not hanging out with bourgeois upper middle class people. I'm hanging, the forms I'm interested in are, are forms of mass performance that the, that the majority of people who are middle class, lower middle class and poor engage in. And when you're in those communities, everybody's hanging out together. So the oldest child looks over the younger child. It's, it's take a, takes a village kind of thing. Yeah. That's the world, in spite of the way I look, you wouldn't know it from the way I look, but I, that was actually the world I grew up in. Yeah. I was born in the 50s in this very cross-generational family where the migrants had stayed in the neighborhoods that they came from and their children had stayed in that neighborhood. And so when there was a birthday party of a cousin, 50 people showed up, you know, wow. and, and we went to a park like Filipinos do. You know, we went to a park that was free because not everybody had much money and everybody bought a plate. And as the eldest child of my generation on both sides of the family, I was the one, and I saw this in the Philippines, I would be the oldest child that watched out over all the other ones that took on that responsibility because they knew little Billy or they knew little Sally, you know, they, they knew that that's kind of what they did and the adults you know did their own thing so you know so when I got to the Philippines and um at one point I was dating the Filipino guy and um and uh one of his uh, his brothers um let's see his his brothers my brother had a kid to be baptized so we go to the baptism and like somebody didn't show up who was supposed to hold the baby at the baptism so like they give me the baby <laughs> they give me the baby to hold at the baptism during the ceremony and I, I thought, you know, and I've reflected on that moment, like to a lot of people, that would be like, might be their worst nightmare. And in a profoundly individualistic Western culture, it's like the first date, well, okay, not the first date, but you know, you're dating somebody and they put you in that kind of a family situation that's that tight, that clingy. And I'm like, this is totally normal. This is like, yeah. So that's the other part of the Philippines. It's like, it's, and it's taken me over a decade to understand that my connection to that place is it's part of it's woven into the fabric of my life and my upbringing it is and of course your body the body returns that's right just a astonishing well i i mean i knew some of that but that's profound i mean that's a whole book in and of itself how that research that idea that relationship that consciousness that community was created just astonishing and leads sadly and tragically to my to my next question because you and i have spoken relatively often about the nature of capitalism good sir that's capitalism brought us together in many ways but look how do i phrase this uh performing arts in australia is going through a tough time and that is an absolute understatement it's going through a relatively tough time internationally but australia is now becoming a real hot spot yeah. of challenge, of problem, nay, disaster. So why is this happening, Will? Well, I, pre-COVID, we've got to remember, I mean, in the Australians, as, and this is true in many governments around the world, your government hates you. 
okay? Your government hates you. If you're working in the arts and social sciences, if you're a historian, if you're trying to, you know, if you're seeking out any truths that, 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 they're, that they're, where there is some oversight or their concerns about the narrative that might come out of your inquiry, your yes. government may hate you. And so, I mean, our government mm -hmm. has been systematically seeking to exterminate us by literally driving us out of business here in Australia, right? It started with systems of metrics and control with, with student outcomes, you know, tying funding to whether or not they get a job, you know, you know that they're narrowly trained for within two years of, 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 of graduating. Um, and also by controlling fees. And of course, we know this, they get this lousy model from the UK. It's like, well, we, wanna, we want more people to study STEM, so we'll, we'll make this degree cheaper and then we'll jack up the fees and the degrees. History, though, we don't want them studying history. I mean, what a useless degree. So history will jack up the fees a hundred and some percent. But, there. but Will, the funniest thing is they're doing that while arguing for the market economy. So, so that, I mean, that's always been the amusing bit for me. So I'd be, oh, it's the, let the market decide. Well, Thank no, you. we won't let the market decide because people still want to study history as much as physics. So that's we right. can't allow the market to decide on this particular issue. Sir, please Thank continue. You. Thank you. Um, you know, I spent a year in Poland under communism, studying the you know studying the economics of the of the Eastern European Union or SMIE as we used to call it, and um, SMIE, yeah, and. That is the Soviet model. That's that's the irony of it. It's like, thank you for that, you know, because they are using this kind of Soviet model while embracing capitalism, this neoliberal capitalism. It's completely bonkers. So COVID, of course, comes along. But before COVID came along, the loss of funding um, in this country and in others uh, that supports the emerging supports emerging artists in the independent sector. Okay, so the indie sector and even the mid the mid level theater sector that has just been smashed in Australia for for like almost a decade now. So COVID comes along and it is like the death knell. It's like it's already feels like it's over and it's hopeless. And a lot of mid career artists and people particularly working as in, in training, a lot of artists also have to be have to work as as teachers as trainers. So like even if they're working part time gigs, um, that's what a allows them to be an artist, right? So mm -hmm. like everybody's been thrown under the bus. I cannot tell you how many, you know, programs have been eliminated in, in my area in the performing arts. I think we've lost six to eight in the last years. Aren't you popular? Yeah. yeah. So six, I think we've lost six to eight in the last year or in the, yeah. you know, since COVID. Um, and, you know, people, people are retraining. I mean, people I know who applied for jobs at Flinders are retraining as psych psychologists, you know, for instance. Um, you know, they're starting, one, another dear friend just gave up and she had a Scot she had a UK passport. So she went back to her ancestral home, Scotland. And, you know, was poor as a church mouse, but she's happy. Music, of course, has been really devastated. Music oh festivals, God. kaboom. It's like, you know, when, how are they, how are they going to come back? And then, of course, we've got the additional problem of the shift in viewing patterns. And um, I know that um, I have become... Um, partly because of my, you know, European family connections, I've become completely devoted to Scandinavian um, long-form television. Yes. And, and between Netflix and our national broadcaster, SBS, that does the diverse broadcasting here, I, I have seen almost everything that's been created in the last, you know, 10 years. And I love those shows <laughs> for the way in which character unfolds and the complexities of the political social environment are part of the backdrop of the action. And it's like, I mean, that's just my thing, you know, because my first degree was, was international politics. So of course, of course I'm into that. Um, and I, you know, and sometimes when I'm watching these shows and I cry at the end of like the, you know, like the, the, the Danish one, The Legacy, it ran for so many seasons oh. when it ended, I cried because I knew these people so well. It was bereft. Like check off. I was bereft because my family has left me. In when that when that series started, I thought you're an asshole. You're a jerk. You know. And but then over time, you come to see everybody is equally flawed. This is Chekhov, right? This yeah. is a master Russian playwright Chekhov. It's like we're all equally flawed. Um, and then in the, but the, and then in the end, but we're all equally lovable. Right. Yeah. And it's like and long form TV creates the opportunity for that kind of trajectory so that at the end of it, we feel so invested in these people. They are us. They are our brothers and sisters and and, and so on. So I think, you know, I, I'm also concerned that, you know, I think that what, what I get out of that 
oh, that's that's a hell of a lot. So will I go back to the theater and put up with, you know, just taking a punt on something, you know, that may or may not have that deliverable? I don't know. I'm still going. Why do I go? Because I know that, you know, people, what, what we're seeing unfold in, well, turn on your computers and take a look at what's happening in Melbourne today. You yeah. know, 20 months of lockdown, people are like, ah, you know, we are humans. We crave contact with other humans. It's like, so everything I'm getting from Netflix, all those warm feelings, it's like, I still want to be in a room. I know a lot of us do in that shared space. It's yeah. like, I mean, and, you know, <laughs> this book, you know, it's like, that was all about a shared experience. I think yeah. the, the festivals that I want to hang out and, and write about, I've th thought about them. They are, they are, I call them, I don't have a better term for it. They're festivals of mass immersion. They're festivals where everybody is a participant. You know, every, if you're, you can't be an unwilling, you cannot be unwilling. You are dragged into it, right? Yeah. In the kinds of festivals that have changed my life. You can't stand on the sidelines and be the ethnographer and taking photos because uh -huh. You know, some like in the Philippines, when I tried to do that some years ago, a local bakla, you know, jumped up on the verge and pulled my hand and said, okay, white guy, get down here and party with me and my girlfriends. Shut up. You know, and like, yeah. So like these, like we need that. That's what sustains us. So it will come back, but I think we're, it's going to be awfully damn hard because of the loss of funding and the hostility of governments. Oh, it's, it's stunning. And Will, again, the paradox, because you and I have often talked about not capitalism, but capitalisms. The paradox of this situation is also profound because this, this particular ideology in these governments is very focused on SME, small and medium sized enterprises, yeah. right? Now, of course, most performing arts, certainly a lot of musicians, all our creative industries crew, it, it's, a, it's an SME model. So again, here's the bloody paradox where this is supposedly what these governments stand for. And yet here it is in these particular industries and it's not recognized as an SME money-making business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Now, you and I are starting to wind ourselves up as we're reaching the end of our conversation, but let's wind ourselves up further because nothing gets you and I going more when we see each other than a conversation about books, right? Now, you've committed deeply. Here we go, Rob. Here we go. You've committed deeply to the, the scholarly monograph. I've committed deeply to the scholarly monograph. Books matter. As we move through the contemporary university system, you and I keep going into meetings where people tell us, well, books don't matter. Right. What do you want to say about this? Um, well, I want to say shut up. Shut up. Shut because, up. Yeah, shut we, up. Because we, we know they matter. I mean, we, we know they matter because of the impact that they, they have. I mean, I would, I would rather write one good book than a thousand lousy journal articles. And the problem that we're facing in the profession, many of us, is that our metrics are about really there's more bang for the buck for us to produce three or four quality journal articles in a top ranked journal that's worth as much as this or maybe more depending on the system that you're counting now that book which took 10 years of research and yeah there were some spin-off articles but it's like that book that can't be an article it's a different line of inquiry altogether. So it's like I was compelled, like my body compels me to return. I mean, a book allows you to figure deep, complex issues out in ways that a journal article can. Yep. I mean, there's everything to be said about the scale of, of, the, of, of that kind of writing. You can make links and connections that are impossible in a shorter period of writing, piece of writing. And even if you, even if they're in your head, they have to be edited out because you got to get it down to whatever, you know, 7,000, 10,000, 3,500 words. A book also gives you time. And this is also why it is not valued and why we're all struggling to write books. Books take time. But that's also why they're worth doing, because that time allows for a deeper connection to the writing and the field that is that is not possible in shorter period of, uh, periods of time. The impact of books, well, I know. I mean, I've got the highest citation index 
in my field in this country. You have to be full professors, you know, in Google Scholar and in what's that other metric that everyone looks to? Woo! Well, yeah, but, but it's like, but, but my I think, I think it was Scopus, but I'm going to call Scopus. it. Yeah, it's <laughs> like Scopus up there in the stratosphere. It's like, and that, that's actually, I thought I was a loser because I wasn't bringing in money because, you know, I, I'm not bringing in you know, I, I can, you know, my, I always felt like I, once I came to Australia, I began to feel like a loser as an academic. And then I looked at my citation index and I looked at everyone else's and I'm like, oh, well, I don't really care what they think. Because like, I know that my work circulates. It's like my, my Singapore book, I wrote that a million years ago. I don't even think it's that great a book. I wrote it 20 years ago. I read it, it read it now. Yeah, so so I, I was at a conference, you know, I go to conferences and people quote me I've forgotten what I wrote, you know, and they're, they're, they're quoting as Peterson says about it. I don't and, I, and I'm listening and I'm like, damn, that's, that, that's pretty good. Did I write that? You know, but it's like, to, but the thing about, it's not, this isn't about ego and people quoting you at conference. This is as if you are writing something that you figured out that is in a new way, that is in a foundational way, you know, the way I put different Philippine, indigenous Filipino frames together in looking at community, self, and performance in these rituals, many of them taught linked to religion, that was new, okay? Yes. So, so that was original. That could not be sustained, that those arguments in a short piece of writing. And that will live beyond me, right? That, yes. That's out there in the world circulating, but that also is my point of entry into the world. So people want to interview me about these books and they have. You and know, they I do. Another podcast that I just, I did a podcast the other day with a, a new institute that's being created at the, the National University of Singapore um, wow. on the study of Asian Catholics, right? It's Amazing. Through the Asia Research Institute. And it's like, they, you know, this book's, if that book's, if this, thing, this book, this book, I'll hold it up again. Hold it up again. Please buy it. Please, please buy it. I know it's hard to get. It's like, you can't get PDFs. You got to order it from Hawaii. Bob. I'll do links to it. Fashion book. Anyway, so, um, but, but yeah, because the, the interview, the guy who was interviewing me complained about access, uh, being able to get it. But, but it's like, but that wouldn't happen without, so now I got homies. So this just happened yesterday. Okay. So wow. this, this, I've been at the Asia Research Institute. I don't think he, he didn't know me from that. He's a young, young, young academic, recent PhD. He's read this book. He wants to have a conversation about Catholicism in Asia. Now, I, like, Who's looking seriously at Catholicism in Asia? Well, not that many of us. I was, I thought I had nothing further to say. I wrote this book and then I started on another project. I thought, well, that's done and dusted. Now I talked to this guy and he's like, well, yeah, I would really like to, you know, it would be great if you could be involved in this initiative. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, wow. why should I say no to that? That was because of a book. That Very wouldn't have happened in an article, right? So that's that's life changing. I just think of you know my next steps forward as as someone who is not a young academic and 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 who's leaving Flinders. Um, you know, I thought, well, maybe this maybe it's finally the end of this academic career. But it's like, but people are knocking on my door. They're wanting me to do stuff, and it's interesting, and it relates, and it comes from those books. It comes from the foundational scholarship, and that at this point in my life, as a sixty five year old who spent thirty five years in this profession. That's what I want to be doing. I don't want to be just working for the, you know, working for the man or the woman. Yeah. You know, and the Will, the book stands. In an academic life, a book is a full stop. Yeah. And we write articles and they're commas and there might be, you know, a report which might be a semicolon, but the book stands. And it stands through our career as this powerful moment where knowledge changes and where we've stood for something. Amen. Yeah. You're a legend, mate. Last question for me. And of course, this is helping so many students around the world. I cannot tell you, but just getting your reflection, not on the end of a career, Will, but on simply, again, the pause and the next stage of this career, which I think is going to be much more interesting than what's happened in the last 10 years, to be frank. But just a final question for students moving into their career and thinking about the relationship between teaching and research. I think our systems at the moment, particularly promotion systems, are encouraging specialisation. So you are research only, you are teaching only. Now, Will, looking back on everything we've shared and everything you've gone through in your life, what would you talk or say to students about building the relationship between teaching and research? 
Well, it's it's this is this is this is the hard question because yeah, you, yeah. you've got to have a job to do that, right? Yeah. So it's like so then so then it becomes where you are locally. How do you build a career? How do you even get that job? How do you how do you get the first job and stay in the game? Um, for some people here in Australia, building the career. If you're um, a researcher who's got an idea that is it connected with the grants that someone else might be working on, it might be working in teams. You know, it might be you know connecting with so and so down the hallway who's working with that. You go talk to them. You get on. You know, so there's this strategic investment in building a career that way as a research career. But that could also be the pathway to a balanced role, to a so-called balanced role. Now, what's a balanced role you know we still got these in, in in our system of course they call them balanced roles which means what academics were supposed to do like for time memorial you know it's like yeah. somehow it's this new thing oh balanced role i feel so balanced it's like, that, that, it's uh, like no that's, that's the job right. mate that's that was that's our that's that right was teaching and research right and um and I'd love doing both. And I, I think you also have to accept that wherever you are at any moment in time, it's never going to be balanced. I mean, I think the balance that I had for teaching and research, I had it for about 10 minutes in 2014. <laughs> and it was really great. I, mean, I had it for six months uh, in 2014 and early 2015. And it was when I came to a new position at Flinders and I was not overloaded with teaching responsibilities and teaching new stuff. Because there are going to be times in your career where, you know, you're they're the new kid on the block and there's four classes that need to be taught and boom, it's thrown at you and your research just goes, it has to go, it has to go, okay? Yeah. I mean, you can try valiantly to keep it alive, but you're going to be 90% teaching in those times. Yes. But you've got to jealously, value, you know, uh, you know, protect your time. It's yeah. at some point, you know, when... You know, when things get, when things, well, things will always be crazy, but when you can fight back some time to keep the research going, you have to, because once you lose the research, for most of us, it does mean the end of your career, you know, if, and then, or unless you just really love the teaching and you want a teaching focused position, that is appropriate for some people. I mean, I came from, uh, I taught for many years in a California university that was not a research intensive university. Yes. It was teaching focused. We were brilliant teachers. My colleagues were fabulous teachers. We did a hell of a lot of teaching. And the research you did was just sort of like, you know, the icing on the cake. I mean, frankly, I'm sure it's more competitive now, but it, there, it was not particularly demanding. And um, I was quite happy working in that environment because I, lo I, I love my colleagues and I love my students. So for some people getting off the sort of, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the research A universities, the research ones, the being in those top research universities, it's like you can do research from wherever you are. My research evolved when I was at one of the so-called teaching universities. That's where I got into the Philippines. That's really where it all started. I had a sabbatical, I went away. Um, and I had some time and then, you know, I was able to sort of transform my, my really transform my life. But um, we, we've also talked as well, you know, over the years, this phrase uh, research led teaching has come up um, and then, then that sort of disappeared. But um, I, I think that I do, whenever possible, I do teach from my research and from my interests. Um, whenever I can, I weave that in and I know what that means to students. Now, I don't do that just in a gratuitous way, like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I was I worked in San Francisco when this happened and when AIDS hit, which is true. You know, I was at ground zero. And, you know, it's like, yeah, so some of that personal stuff is is it's meaningful. Useful. It means something because it's like you were there then you're there as a witness. So sometimes you bring that up. But yes. it's like, but if you teach from what you know and what and you've got, you know, some context for it, students will value and respect that. And I've been lucky enough that, um, and maybe I've driven it as well, you know, where, where I've been at universities where programs were new, where we were shifting things around and we sat around the table and we said, what do our students need to know? What do we think is important? And then what, what are our capacities and skills as teachers? And what do you want to teach? You know, I mean, when I ran the Center for Theater and Performance at, at Monash, we restructured the curriculum because we were we claimed to be doing everything for all students all the time we were doing everything we were making everybody happy i mean the website was completely bonkers and so when we got together it's like we just started with well you know what do we want from our teaching yeah. and and you know how can we make this thing work as an in integrated whole yeah. so um 
Yeah. So, I mean, and I guess the final advice about the, the so-called, you know, balance is that, you know, when you carve out that space for your own time, you just don't let anyone get in there. That means you don't answer emails. That means you answer emails only when you're done with the deep thinking and your brain is completely fried and it's six o'clock on Friday. Maybe you want to check just to make sure that people don't think that you died. Okay. <laughs> That's when you open the email and you spend 15 minutes responding only to the important ones and the rest of it, you just like go. And um, it will make you a happier person too. Look, look, Will, it will. And Will, I thank you for the time we've shared, not only in, the, in this vlog, we were always heading to this vlog, you and I. I thank you for your friendship. You've been, I mean, you're one of the first people I met. I think we met the first week, didn't we? Absolutely. The first week I started, brother. Yeah. And uh, you've been a light and you've been a beacon of not only opportunity and hope and rigor and kindness and intelligence, but you've always reminded me about why we got into this gig in the first place. And as we've talked about in this conversation, that we carry the places with us, I will always carry you yeah. with me. And I thank you for that. Amen. Amen. See, see, you, see you in Aotearoa. <laughs> see you in Aotearoa very soon, Will. And on behalf of Will and myself, what a legendary human he is. We wish you all love, light, and peace. Will and T out. Rock and roll. <laughs>